welcome to devlog number 23, the last devlog before early access release. It's been over a month and a half since the last devlog, and even though we've been silent on here, we certainly haven't been idle. We're going to conclude this last 50-day sprint to the finish line with a record 31 patches. We've been frantically getting everything ready to go for release. When I come home from work, I just work on this game. On the weekends, I get up at 6 in the morning and I work until I go to bed. If any of you were ever wondering what it takes to get an indie game out the door on time with a full-time job on top of it, there's your benchmark. But it's all going to be worth it in the end because the game is in a really great state now, both technically and in terms of balance. It's been a hard road to get here through 715 git commits, over 2600 lines of patch notes, 4000 lines of just notes that I've taken on gameplay and things I needed to change, thousands of audio files, a few hundred meshes and textures, and of course, we can't forget the 92,000 lines of code that make this whole game tick. I'm really pleased to announce that we're feature locked, and the game that's on Steam now is what people will be playing when we release on February 11th, almost exactly two years after we first started development. And I can already tell at the beginning of this recording that this is going to be the longest devlog I've ever done. So with no time to waste, let's get started. The first thing I want to talk about is that we had a fourth team member join. We weren't thinking that we were going to be able to get music into the game until after early access release, but Lauren is a really talented composer who joined the team just after the last devlog. I had a very particular mood that I wanted the game's music to convey, so we spent weeks going back and forth, tweaking things here and there, making changes, adding instrumentation, removing instrumentation, until we got a main menu theme that I was really satisfied with. I'm really glad we went through all that revision and iteration, because once we'd finished the main menu theme, I set Lauren loose on the actual in-game skirmish music, and she knew exactly what to do from there. And she banged out the rest of the skirmish game music with very little need for revision, owing to her talents and also the fact that we spent the time to get the theme right, and so everything else could be based on that. The skirmish game music is dynamic in that it changes between the, the multiple phases of the game between hunt and fight and recovery, or what we call them. And it's also comprised of a number of different clips that are randomized in their order to keep it from getting repetitive and dull. And now I'll take a break here and give you a sampling of the fruits of her labors. Next, we did a final pass on all the textures for all of the ship hulls. Stefmo updated a lot of the texture generation graphs to increase the quality of the normal maps, add things like these red danger zone stripes around all the places where mounts are found, add lifeboat launchers, which we'll talk about later, docking clamps, fueling ports, cargo hatches, airlocks, placards around those things. We also added a couple extraneous details to the normal maps just to give the surfaces a little more detailed quality and just break them up a little bit. Overall, I think the details like the stripes and the placards really help kind of sell the believability that these are actual warships that people live and work on, and that they have all the things they would need to be functional in the universe. The B-roll playing in the background is footage from our last community fight night, and you'll notice that when we first make contact with the enemy here, the track icons are these question marks instead of the old diamonds. I always thought it was a little weird that as soon as you picked up a track, you knew it was a ship, even though it would say unknown, or you pick up a missile and it's got the missile icon immediately. So now the icon's dependent on what Intel thinks the object is. So when you figure out it's a ship, it becomes a diamond. When you figure out it's a missile, it becomes the X. I also did my first improvements to the AI basically since its inception. A number of things have changed in the game that the AI didn't know how to do. For example, initial formations. Initial formations serve an alternate purpose when it comes to the AI in that now I can use it to teach the AI how a fleet is intended to be played and what's meant to be grouped together. So now when a game starts and the AI is building its task units, it'll look at what the initial formations are and it'll build them based on those formations. And if there are no initial formations in the fleet, it'll use its previous logic of grouping high-value units with escorts. 
objectives have been added since the AI was implemented, and so it didn't really know how to play those at all. If you were playing a control game against the AI and it captured a point, it did it purely by luck that it happened to choose a location to move to that was on a control point. But now the AI prioritizes objectives on the map and will move to capture them in order to secure a points victory. And finally, map boundaries didn't exist when the AI was initially implemented, so now it's aware of the map boundary and if it tries to do a pathfinding target outside of it, it'll get redirected back into the map. On the UI front, we now have a new accessibility section in the game settings. These settings include colorblind modes, so for all the three different types of colorblindness we have different color palettes. And you can even see a preview below along with tooltips that tell you what those colors are normally used for. There's also a much requested active pause feature with a controllable pause speed. This is for players who have trouble with intense micro or, or dealing with lots of things at once. And the speed of the pause can be slowed all the way down to 0%, which is a full pause. And a few other options like hiding the skybox. In-game now, there's also the ability to control the posture of entire formations at once through the ship bar. Previously, if I wanted to, for example, turn off the radars on all three ships in this formation, I would have to go through each one of them and turn them off or on. Now, by holding shift, just like the same way that you issue orders to entire formations at once, it'll put the ship bar into formation mode as well. You can see on the posture buttons when there's a difference between the ship settings that they'll show the mix option, and clicking it while in formation mode will apply that setting to every ship in the formation. This has been a feature that people have been requesting for a long time, and it makes managing large formations postures a lot easier. Probably the most contentious UI element in the game is the dreaded sphere widget. The homeworld style movement widget, or the dial widget as I call it in this game, works really great for selecting positions in space where you're picking a termination point. When I pick a position for my ship to move to with the dial widget, I'm picking a place where I want it to end up. When it comes to weapons, however, particularly missiles, where when they reach their last waypoint, what you really care about is where they're going after and where they're going to acquire a target, the dial widget has some serious limitations. The issue is that because of the nature of a triangle, the direction that you're picking isn't uniform as you ascend or descend in height. This becomes especially apparent when you're trying to make missile shots that are going straight up or straight down, or nearly straight up or straight down. And my solution to this was the sphere widget, which is a tool that allows you to pick directions uniformly on the surface of a sphere. The idea sounds simple enough and really great, but implementing it is a whole nother story. The issue is that you're trying to control three dimensions that are not compatible with each other. When the dial widget moves up and down, all you're really doing is moving a flat plane vertically and you're casting against that plane to figure out where you're going to be picking the position. So the question with the sphere becomes, which two dimensions do I want to correlate with each other? If you correlate azimuth and radius, then what happens is that as elevation increases, that plane tilts. So the first implementation of the sphere widget actually had the radius tied to the camera. What you would do is you would drive your camera's orbit point away from where your ship was towards where you wanted the waypoint to be, and then your mouse would control where on the surface of the sphere the point where you were picking was. This was okay and some people liked it, but also a little unintuitive and very frustrating when your camera was currently focused on and tracking a ship, because then you couldn't drive the radius out at all. So the next version correlated azimuth and radius, but because of the problem I described earlier, I used two separate plane casts. One horizontal plane to control the azimuth, like the dial widget, and then one that was tilted but also facing the camera to control the radius. The problem is that those two planes don't always line up perfectly, especially if the player is trying to change both of them at the same time. Adjustments to both in the same frame can lead to pretty strange jittering behavior, and if the player wasn't careful, it would be easy for the sphere widget to just jump off to infinity. Despite its shortcomings, this implementation stayed around for a really long time, over a year, because I just didn't want to go back and try again. But with release coming up, I knew I had to get a solution to this problem that was satisfying and easy to use and intuitive, and that didn't have these awful jittering artifacts and that people could use to lay in missile waypoints effectively and quickly. So my solution to this was A-B testing, or rather, AF testing. I sat down on a Saturday morning, and over the course of that day, I implemented six different sphere widgets, all with different correlations between radius, azimuth, and elevation. I then made all six of those widgets available through a drop-down menu in the gameplay settings so that the players could play with them all and see which ones they liked the best. You're probably thinking that I'm building up to a heartwarming story of user testing success, but I'm not. This was actually a really big mistake on my part because the widget that I ended up selecting was not one the players really liked. They all wanted the version of the widget that mirrored the dial widget the closest, but that one was also the one that didn't do what the sphere widget was meant to do. So why did I do all that user testing and then just throw it all out and make a decision on my own anyway? Let me show you what I ended up going with for the sphere widget and explain why. This version of the sphere widget in its normal state allows you to select a position on the surface of the sphere. Pretty simple so far, right? 
The benefit of having these two dimensions, azimuth and elevation, unlocked together makes it really easy to create fans of missiles around a target. These fans of missiles are important because by creating a spread of missiles, you maximize your chances of picking up or acquiring a maneuvering target with your missile seekers. Other versions of the widget that correlated azimuth and radius or elevation and radius didn't allow you to create patterns of missiles like this rapidly without having to continuously lock and unlock one of the dimensions. That fact limited its utility and the speed at which you could create good missile patterns, but it wasn't a deal breaker on its own. The real problem comes down to changing radius. With this version of the widget, you hold control to lock the direction and draw the radius in or out. The real benefit here is that because you're controlling radius and only radius, it works just as effectively at the zenith and nadir as it does on the plane itself. With the other implementations that mimic the dial widget more closely, if you were trying to make a missile shot up or down and you misjudged the radius you were trying to go to, when you increased the elevation and realized you'd screwed it up, you basically had to return to the level of the plane and draw the radius back in before increasing the elevation and trying again. Once I realized this, I knew it was a deal breaker for this version of the widget and that it was not going to be what I was going to be able to put in the final game. I knew this was the right decision at the time, I'd thought through it, I knew what the sphere widget needed to do. I had sat in the missile tutorial myself and tried out every widget, seeing which one I was most efficient with when it came to plotting long distance or blind missile shots. And with only a couple minutes of practice using the widget that I ended up selecting, I was able to quickly route missile shots around asteroids when compared to using the previous widgets which I, the developer, who had been using that widget for years, was struggling to make just the day before. But, as I predicted, when I made the code change and locked everyone into using this widget, people were not very happy. There were lots of requests to bring the drop-down box back, which was not something that I was going to do. But, also as I predicted, and after a few minor tweaks, people got used to it. As they went to the tutorial and slung missiles around for a little while and practiced with it, they got really used to it, and now I regularly see people plot missile shots with waypoints with the new sphere widget quickly and effectively, and I know that I made the right decision. So that was a really long time spent talking about one measly UI element, but it was such a long process, and it's so unique to this game and such a core part of the missile gameplay that I really just wanted to get all of my thoughts out on this big decision. Since I was just showing some tutorial footage there, this is probably a good time to mention that we finally updated the tutorial to match all of the UI changes that have taken place over the last year or so. Along with those updates, we also completely redid the voiceover with my wife providing the voice acting. I was really excited to do that. It was a neat way to get her into the game, and I was really happy that she sat down for hours and recorded all that with me. Drives have always kind of been in a weird place in that you need them, but there wasn't really any kind of choice involved. We had a large drive and a small drive, depending on the size of the ship, but now we've added five additional drives per size to give you lots of different options. We've got the standard drive and its reinforced variant, then we've got this whiplash drive that gives you increased top speed, the dragonfly which gives you a higher turn rate, the raider for people who like to spend all their time at flank speed, and this mid-range prowler drive that significantly reduces your signature but also gives you miserable acceleration. The nice thing about all these drives is that there's a reason to use every single one of them and none of them step on each other's toes, so you get to pick the drive for exactly the application that you want. You also probably notice these new editor overlays which are no longer the old wireframe boxes. I'll talk about this more later, but switching to a new vector line drawing library allowed me to get these nice, transparent cubes that I can render over top of the sockets. I think it makes it a lot easier to see where in the hull things are located rather than the wireframe boxes which all kind of blended together. We also had a pretty big change to damage control which is the division now between prioritization and restoration. When I hover over these damaged components you can see that I get two tooltips now. Click to change priority and shift click to restore. The reason for this is that there are cases where there can be debuffs and destroyed components, for example, an atmosphere leak here, that I may want to prioritize restoring because, for example, fires spread to other compartments. However, in the old system, if I wanted to prioritize that fire, I would also be forced to restore the component, which is a very limited thing that you can do. So basically, if I wanted that fire to go out, I would have to wait until everything else on the ship was repaired before the damage control teams would go to that component and put that fire out because it was destroyed, so it had the lowest priority. And now you can see that there are different colors, blue for prioritization and purple for restoration. We've also got these filter buttons up at the top of the damage control board now, which allows you to suppress certain parts of the ship depending on what you're looking for. I think it helps clean up the clutter a lot, especially on the larger ships where there are just so many things, and such a large percentage of them are thrusters, which most of the time you really don't want to see. And finally, when a component is restored, its health is now restored to the maximum repairable HP, instead of starting at zero and having to work its way back up. 
The reason for this is that it's super frustrating to waste a restore on a component, have it go to zero hit points, and then get hit by a shell immediately after and go back to being destroyed and you just wasted that restore. So now you can just sink all that time into restoring the component and have it as soon as that timer expires, it be up and running again. On the opposite side of damage control, damage dealing, I made an improvement to AP rounds. The issue with armor piercing rounds is that they would only do damage in a straight line, so if you didn't happen to have the shot come in on a trajectory that lined up with a component to do damage to, even if you punctured the armor you really wouldn't do anything to the ship. So now when an AP round impacts, if it doesn't find anything in its direct path, it'll cast out a couple of spalling rays to see if there's anything a certain number of degrees off of that path that it can do damage to. This significantly improves the utility of AP rounds by limiting the number of wasted shots that do no damage to internal components. Going back to the ship bar for a minute, command-guided missiles like the Repost, Hurricane, and Mace now have the ability to override the calm state of a ship. So for example, when I have missiles incoming and I'm firing reposts automatically, the ship's communications, if they were in receive only, will be automatically overridden to transmit so that the ship can control those missiles. Previously, the ship would just automatically fire these command-guided interceptors or the player would fire hurricanes and they wouldn't understand why they were just going off into infinity, so this should alleviate that especially for new players who don't understand how communications work. You also might notice two new posture buttons in the ship bar, WCON and PD Zone. WCON or Weapons Control allows the player to set weapons hold, tight, or free. Weapons hold is something players have been requesting for a while to allow them to queue up things like missile shots from multiple ships and then release them all at once. This also allows your turrets to train onto a target when issued a fire order, but not open fire until you set free or tight. Free also has an added functionality which should help cut down on certain micro, where when a ship has been receiving fire for a few seconds and doesn't have any other active firing orders, it'll automatically return fire on a track in the direction that it's receiving fire from. However, it'll only do this with turreted weapons, as missiles are scarce enough that I didn't want to frustrate players by having their ships waste missiles on the least opportune times. PD zone can be set to point or area, and that'll control where the ship's point defenses will be targeted. Area is the current behavior where it'll attack any missile that's in range, and point will only attack missiles that are a direct threat to the ship based on a comparison between the line from the ship to the missile and the missile's velocity vector. I mentioned a new vector line drawing library earlier. I was originally using Vectrosity to draw all of my in-world lines that you're seeing here. It's an okay library, but it has a lot of limitations. It's very focused on game objects, so there's a lot of overhead when you have lots of lines like I have in the tactical view. It also has this extremely annoying error that I've been trying to track down for two years and I was never able to, where certain lines in certain positions would cause a frustum error. And it would cause a quick frame drop and then four errors to pop up in the bottom left, and I just could not get rid of it. I really didn't want to release the game in a state where people would just be experiencing these errors all the time. New players who were not familiar with it or who weren't in our Discord would see this and think the game was just this buggy piece of crap. And so I sat down over the weekend, it's one of my last things that I was going to do, and I converted every line that's drawn in the game into this new library called Shapes, which is entirely GPU based, it doesn't rely on game objects or anything, it's much more performant, and the lines are much crisper. Unfortunately, most of this footage was captured before I did that changeover, so you're still seeing the old Vectrosity lines, but trust me, they look a lot better. So, RIP Vectrosity, I won't really miss you. If you're looking really closely, you may have noticed the cluster of blue circles with X's in them clustered around that dead light cruiser over on the left. These are the new lifeboats that ships eject when they're eliminated. About 45 seconds after a ship is eliminated, they'll start ejecting one by one and fly about 2-2.5 two to two and a half kilometers away from the ship. I think they add a lot in terms of the immersion and the believability, and they'll play a larger role in the strategic game later on when actually recovering crew becomes important. For now they serve as a really diegetic indicator that a ship's been eliminated on the enemy team when you start picking up these slow moving tracks ejecting from it before your intel classifies them as lifeboats. Which was another reason that I switched over to having those question marks as the initial unknown track symbol. Now because I don't want to limit what players can do in the game, there is the uncomfortable capability that players can target the lifeboats and so what we did was we went back and talked to all of our old voice actors and got them to record a couple new additional lines. Because the issue is that when you order a ship to fire on a track, they'll give a very enthusiastic aye aye or a we got em now kind of line voice callback. And so we wanted to convey to the player that this is not something we really want you doing even though we're not going to stop you from doing it. So the new lines when you choose to fire at something like a lifeboat will say, are you sure you want to do this or you want us to do what? Something that just kind of suggest to the player that this is not how we want the game to be played. 
All right, we're almost out of the woods here. I've been saying for a really long time that we wanted to replace the Corvette model. When we did all the level of details for all the hulls, we skipped the Sprinter. When we went back and updated all the textures, we skipped the Sprinter because we knew we were going to have to do this and we didn't want to just redo all that work when we didn't have to. There were a couple issues with the old model, one of which was that it was kind of comically small. It was way too small to be an actual Corvette, which is really just meant to be a light frigate. It just didn't look like a proper warship. It also had a bunch of non-standard mount sizes, like a half-size Class 2 and a weird, thin Class 3, sort of Class 3. So in an effort to make it A, look better, and B, standardize all the mount sizes across Faction 1, we wanted to redo the model. However, despite sitting on it for a month or two, I just had no idea what I really wanted it to look like. After trying and failing to draw a concept several times, I realized that we had a really good concept artist in our Discord who's worked on games like Angels Fall First in the past, and so I reached out to him and asked, hey, I'm kind of in a bind right now, can you help me out with a concept for this ship? And so after some back and forth iteration, he came up with a really great design, which we translated into the model that you're seeing in game right now. I really love the way this thing looks, it's probably one of my favorite ships in the game at this point. It looks sleek and fast, but also heavy enough to be a real warship. It also has a standard set of mounts now, so it's got two class 1 point defenses, a class 2 on the nose, and a class 3, a full-size class 3 on the bottom. I was a little worried with that class 3 on the bottom, it was going to be a little overpowered. The old Corvette Corvette swarms were pretty intense and difficult to deal with, and having that full class 3 and the ability to mount a 250mm gun on a ship that's so small and fast was a risk, but it turned out to not really be a problem. People have built 250mm Corvette swarms and they're really not that overpowered, so I'm glad to see that that worked out. So we get our better model, we get our standard mount sizes, and they're not nearly as hard to deal with as the old Corvettes. That's probably mostly due to its internal layout being mostly unchanged. It can still have only the same compartments and modules that it had before, which really limits the support that you can have for those weapons. On an unrelated note, you'll also see me using the Orbit Track command, which is new. It allows you to orbit, instead of a fixed position, an actual moving target. The last major thing to talk about before we get to just the litany of minor things that I want to mention is missile balance. I was really hesitant to make any changes to missile balance before release because shortly after EA release, we're going to be releasing our first major update, which is going to be a modular missile system. So I didn't want to invest a lot of time in changes to missiles that were just going to be undone anyway. However, it was pretty apparent that a first order optimal strategy was just missile spam, and while there are plenty of counterplay options for missiles and missile walls are not really that useful against experienced players who know how to work around them, I didn't want to release the game in a state where all the new players who would be playing multiplayer for the first time would just be encountering walls of hundreds of missiles and have no idea how to deal with them. So the solution to this was not to change missiles themselves, but rather their launchers. The reason missile spam is possible is because it's really easy and cheap to get many missiles in space simultaneously. Vertical launchers are only 10 points each, and with enough of them on a ship, it's pretty easy to overcome the throttling of one missile every two seconds. So what I did was use the compounding cost feature of components in order to make it so that every launcher that you add to a ship has a compounding cost of three times. So while the first launcher on a ship is only 10 points, the next one that you want to add is an additional 30 points. This compounding cost factor was a better decision than just straight up increasing the cost of launchers because it doesn't penalize ships that want to bring what I call accessory launchers. And what I mean by that is a ship that has primarily guns or railguns or a beam weapon and carries a launcher just to have a couple missiles with it just in case it needs them. We've only played a couple games since the change was implemented, but I think it's been pretty successful at cutting down missile spam and turning missiles into more of a situational weapon rather than an alpha strike tool. And finally, a number of small things I've implemented, a lobby paging system to get around Steam's limit of 50 lobbies per query. Maybe I'm getting a little overly hopeful that we'll have more than 50 lobbies running at a time, but I'm allowed to dream. I also wrapped up the Steam achievements and all of the art for those, and implementing all the hooks to make the achievements actually unlock. A ceasefire command to make it easy to cancel all the firing orders in a formation or just on a single ship. We also got our first draft of a lore document done, which describes the universe and how the mechanics work and what the factions are. Marshall took the lead on writing out a whole big draft of everything that we were going to need, and then me and Stefmo went in and with lots of discussion we kind of massaged it into what we wanted the factions to look like and be like. We wanted to make sure that both factions were sympathetic in some way and that it wasn't just, oops the player does a colonialism, or on the other hand faction 2 is just unequivocally evil and so the player never has to question any motives. If you're really into lore and are interested in reading it, it's linked in our FAQ and our Discord so you can check it out there. And along with that, we split up the component descriptions into a functional description and then some lore flavor text at the bottom. Because the way it was previously was all the lore and flavor text was grouped in with the actual description of how the component worked, and so it was confusing a lot of new players who couldn't suss out those two things and separate them. 
And finally, we put out a call to our players to submit any of the fleets that they would like to see actually ship with the game so we could have a set of default fleets that serve as good examples to new players who are just picking up the game. And that wraps up my longest devlog ever. My throat really hurts, but it was really good to get all this out and conclude this series just before EA release. It's really exciting to finally be at this point, and we've all worked really hard on this game, so I hope you all like it when you get to play it on February 11th, and I'll see you then.